gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, the lights are on us, of course, so we can barely see you guys, but that's a very good crowd, of course, and a nice night, so appreciate that. Thank you to Doug and Ann Stanton for a phenomenal job, not only with the introductions, but for 10 years, as of, I believe, this week. Uh, almost done on a dare, I think, the National Writers Series. Uh, the dare has paid off. Uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor, but we've been in Traverse City my entire life, going back from Glacier Dome, hockey camp in the 1970s, Barden's Wonder Freeze, which is still there, thank God. I took my son there last night. <laughs> that, by the way, is called pandering, in case you <laughs> weren't aware of that. Uh, so Traverse City is near and dear to my heart. It's always been the capital of the North, of course, but it is becoming, thanks to the National Writers Series and the Film Festival, a cultural capital in the Midwest, if not the nation itself. And given the list of speakers, of course, Anna Quinlan, Tom Broca, Douglas Brinkley, uh, it speaks for itself. So Doug and Ann, hats off, and thank you very much for 10 wonderful years. <laughs> and of course, a hearty thanks to Douglas Brinkley. You will, Ann was very nice with her introduction. You can see me on TV occasionally. Uh, this coming week, you'll see him on every hour on the hour, all stations, all the time. <laughs> it's going to be a very big week, of course, for Dr. Brinkley, to say the least. Um, about the book, you've gotten the introduction, of course. If you've not bought the book yet, I will scold you, but I'll draw you into it from the preface alone. If you read the preface and not buy the book, you are stronger than I am. It's a phenomenal book. Uh, and it's gotten, of course, ringing endorsements from all the big heavy hitters, including Doris Kearns Goodwin, my favorite of the batch here on the back cover. American Moonshot is a thoroughly terrific work that should reach the widest possible audience. As a study in leadership, it is absolutely first rate. As history, it is inspiring and enthralling. And to cap it all, it is a completely riveting story about the space age. I love this book. I agree with her. Uh, I love it too. I had a chance to get to know Elmer Leonard fairly well. You know, at the end of his life, he did some work for him, uh, research for one of his books. And I once asked him, what's the key? He said, you know that boring stuff that you cut out, uh, that, you don't, that you skip past? I go, yeah. He goes, I cut it out. So that's what Douglas has done here. A few things about this book really impressed me as somebody's trying to do what he's doing. Uh, one, the subject matter. Um, we Willie Keeler, the old baseball player, he's five foot four. I uh, was asked how he wins all these batting titles in the 1890s, and he said, it's easy, I hit them where they ain't. Uh, that is my job, of course, the Halifax explosion, no, no, no one heard of that in the United States, of course, until I wrote that book. Uh, we've heard of this, okay? This is hitting right into the shift, basically four guys, and you're pulling the ball anyway. It's a very hard trick to pull off to get people to pay attention yet again to the moon landing, of course, and tell us things we don't already know. He's done that in spades in this book. It's incredible. Uh, history. It's hard to bring it alive, of course. It's so easy to think of it as a glacier that it comes in, it changes things, we're helpless, and it goes out, and the world has changed accordingly. He has done a phenomenal job of putting you into the shoes of JFK and LBJ and John Glenn as it really happened at that time when you really did not know what was going to happen next. And for that reason, it is suspenseful, even though you're pretty sure they make it there. You <laughs> it's like watching the movie Titanic. I know the ship sinks, and yet here I am, enthralled. Uh, it is fascinating what I did not know about this and how nip and tuck it was. So many times the budgeting, the astronauts, the race with the Soviets, of course, it's all there. It's fantastic. And finally, the copious research. When you do this much work, as a, uh, of course, professor at Rice, really serious historical work, so serious. This is the only book that NASA has picked for, to buy for their employees as rep representative of what actually happened with the moon landing. That is high, high praise from a very sticky bunch, to say the least, to know what happened, of course. To do all that work, and then, like Elmer Leonard, to cut out all the stuff you might skip. Uh, it takes a lot of self-discipline. The story moves, it is fantastic. I'm sure Hollywood is calling you already. But for all these reasons, it is a fantastic book. Doug, with all that pre-praise, thank you for being here tonight. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Doug has written about subjects from Henry Ford to Theodore Roosevelt to FDR to Rosa Parks, uh, a wide range of folks, to say the least, all connections connected to you in some way. But you're a kid in Perrysburg, Ohio, just the other side of the border, when all this happens in 69, tell us about your attachment personally to this story. Well, first of all, it's wonderful to be here in Traverse City. It's my first time, even though I grew up on the Ohio-Michigan border and a couple of my friends 
from Perrysburg are here. Um, and so it's, I've always wanted to get her and it's so beautiful. And I'm having such a wonderful time. So thanks for having me into your community. Um, the, um, I, when I was little, my um, mom and dad both made me like, of everybody of a certain age, really watch that big moment when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Um, that was, it'll be 50 years this July 20th, so it's coming up as you intimated. And um, the, we would sleep in a sleeping bag and wait to just see those, that historic moment. Uh, but it always impressed me that Neil Armstrong, the first astronaut on the moon, was from Wapakoneta, Ohio, not that far from Perrysburg. And um, the, I ended up, some years later, I wrote a book on Dean Acheson, Harry Truman's Secretary of State, and then a book on James Forrestal, who was Secretary of the Navy, First Secretary of Defense. And I had the temerity to autograph each of these books of mine, and I sent them to Neil Armstrong at his P.O. box on a farm outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I got a polite blow-off um, in the mail. <laughs> um, it was from his assistant that said, Mr. Armstrong is not um, doing interviews, and he'll read one of the books you sent him. Um, and I, it was only years later that I got a call from NASA and I was asked to actually um, do the oral history interview of Neil Armstrong for NASA. And the date for it was scheduled was right in late um, September of 2001. And what does that tell you? You know, I was watching 9-11 on television and watched that unfold, and I got a hold of my contact at NASA and said, oh, I guess we have to reschedule the interview with Neil Armstrong. He said, no, what do you, Neil doesn't cancel anything. Uh, I said, well, how are we getting there? Because airports were all shut. And he said, well, he's gonna fly himself in. So I drove from New Orleans to Houston and waited, and Neil Armstrong landed his own plane, walked out, sat on a table like this, and allowed me to spend eight hours with him of uh, talking about his entire life. So for me, it was a, getting to, me to know a boyhood hero. Out of that interview, I started thinking about writing this book, American Moonshot, and it got further um, uh, you know, along when the fact that I teach at Rice, where on September 12, 1962, John F. Kennedy gave that incredible speech where he said, we choose to go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard and then talked about public discovery, meaning all of, all of us, Americans taking part in going to the moon. And he said that the, uh, our, our solar system is the new ocean and the new sea, and our astronauts were the new Columbuses and Magellans. And it was done in, at a football stadium at Rice with 35,000 people, right where my history office is. And the NASA lore in Houston, Texas is quite thick, as you can imagine. So the combo of this made me realize I'm gonna go ahead and write the story of why and how the United States went to the moon in 1969. And as I said, as a amateur historian, uh, that is a very gutsy move. So <laughs> write another book about Wa George Washington. Good luck with that. Uh, it's been written about, but he pulled it off. That's incredible. We mentioned earlier that uh, in Brinkley's telling of history, it is not inevitable. Individuals did matter and so did particular moments on which history, in fact, did pivot. And for the five of the guys I want to highlight here, first one is a surprise, perhaps, uh, from the preface and the first chapter, sorry, Jules Verne, who actually figures into the story on the moonshot. Um, do any of you remember the, the French novelist Jules Verne? Well, he wrote a book after the American Civil War, like right after it, from Paris, in which he predicted that the first people to go to the moon will be Americans, and it will happen pretty close to the time when it did in the 20th century, and that they would, um, it would take eight days to go from Earth to the moon and back, and it did take eight days, and um, that it would have like parts of a rocket that would, um, that would break off, and the one that kills me is he said they would leave from Tampa Bay, Florida, and we of course left from Cape Canaveral, Florida, but that's how uh, prescient uh, Jules Verne was uh, as a science fiction novelist, and he had a big influence on John F. Kennedy as a boy, and Neil, um, 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 Neil Armstrong, John Glenn, they all had read that novel um, by Jules Verne, and it, it, it spurred them to dream about the moon and Mars and beyond. 
uh, surprising tie-in there, but one of his great lines in the book is that artists are often ahead of the scientists and the politicians in dreaming bigger things that we end up doing through those other fields, but it happened in that case, of and course. The great, the great novelist Kurt Vonnegut from Indiana was a friend of mine who wrote Slaughterhouse, and Vonnegut used to talk about um, the history of engineering and tinkering in America, that uh, Yankee ingenuity. And uh, uh, Vonnegut, though, was worried um, that when we went to the moon, it was going to be a doomsday prophecy because he got worried that we were neglecting Earth while we were building all these rockets and missiles. Hmm. Now, the did not know about that. Uh, JFK, of course, was a big dreamer. I had a chance to get to know Herb Brooks, who is the hockey coach who beat the Soviets in 1980. And while we're doing a book on his life, of course, and his career, um, he was asking me, what's your favorite movie? And of course, I said Casablanca, because that is the correct answer. <laughs> and I said, OK, I'll bite. What's yours? And he said, and I could not believe this, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> And I looked up and said, you're the meanest man I know. That can't be possible. And he said, it's because we've forgotten how to dream. And Herb Brooks dreamed about what happened in uh, Lake Placid in 1960 when he was cut from the team, 20-year dream. Uh, JFK's dream was pretty much along those lines. This was a dream he held from Jules Verne, from his uh, ocean studies and whatnot. Well, the, I begin a lot of my book with John F. Kennedy. He's born in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1917. And, um, you know, we all know the story of Kennedy and his wealthy father. Uh, but that, when you're born in 1917, it means you're born in a new age, the age of flight. The Wright brothers were in 1903 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. It took a while to perfect the airplane. World War I became the great incubator for aviation. So when you're born in 1917, you're a child of, of the skies. And in fact, just like in our childhoods, or when we were younger, we would have shows like The Jetsons and Lost in Space or Star Trek. Um, back in the 1920s and early 30s, on radio, uh, Buck Rogers and you know Flash Gordon became um, captivated uh, people's imaginations. And CBS in the 1920s would do radio broadcast about going to the moon. And not far from where Kennedy was born in Massachusetts, a man named Dr. Robert Goddard, a professor at Clark University, uh, decided that the way to break the whole game on space was to how do you get a, a projectile up ahead of 62 miles from Earth? How do you break the, the, the um, Earth's gravity grip and put something into space? Nobody's ever done it before. Goddard had dreams of doing it, and he, so he would launch these rockets in a cabbage field in Auburn, Massachusetts, and he'd get written up for noise making and disturbing the peace. Uh, the New York Times wrote a really nasty uh, article about his quackery as a scientist and should he be allowed to teach at a college. Um, and they apologized about 50 years later because <laughs> it was some of Goddard's principles is what took us to the moon in 1969. Um, Goddard couldn't, we couldn't fund rocketeers in America. Charles Lindbergh, 1927, transatlantic flight. Lindbergh found Goddard some money. Um, but when the Great Depression hit in 1929, um, it ended up being that um, Goddard couldn't afford to stay in Massachusetts and moved out to New Mexico, Roswell, New Mexico. So when you hear about space aliens and the like, uh, they weren't crazy out in New Mexico. Uh, there were, were things going out from his Eden Valley ranch uh, that were putting in the sky. But that was about it in the United States in the 1920s and 30s. We didn't have top rocketeers. The country that did was Germany. And um, in the Weimar Republic in Germany, they had great rocketeers. And in my book, I write about somebody, a rough contemporary of JFK, who uh, becomes the top German rocket scientist and that's Werner von Braun. And he ended up not leaving Germany when Hitler came to power and actually becoming an SS officer for the, um, the Third Reich. And it became Hitler's top program was to build rockets to destroy London, Antwerp, and other cities uh, to win World War II. We put our money into a Manhattan project for atomic weapons, but um, the um, uh, Hitler was went on these vengeance weapons, and the V2 uh, in particular would start arcing 210 miles. You would launch it from the Netherlands, and they would did all sorts of havoc in 
uh, destruction in London. And as I tell in the book, by towards the end of the war, um, Von Braun is the most wanted asset by the United States government. We want Von Braun and his technology, and we get it because once Hitler committed suicide in his bunker in Berlin, Von Braun realized if he got arrested by the British, he'd be tried for war crimes against London and killing of civilians with his bombs or missiles. But also they used Jewish labor at the Dora camp to build the vengeance weapons. That's a, a subcamp of Buchenwald, some of the most horrendous Holocaust conditions imaginable. So Von Braun made a deal um, to, they, he took 137 German Nazi rocket scientists, took two train cars, packed it with war, or, or with blueprints and, and, um, and, uh, and moved all of the v vengeance weapons, the missile technology to a cave, hit it, then hit in the Bavarian Alps and sent his baby brother from, um, to go look to um, put his hands up and surrender to the US Army and a private from Sheboygan, Wisconsin encountered Magnus von Braun, and he said, my brother's the Werner von Braun, and a deal was made with the U.S. Army um, under Operation Paperclip, uh, under Harry Truman, their president's order, to move all 137 of the German top rocketeers to Fort Bliss in Texas, El Paso, and um, they were called prisoners of peace, and they started working to build missiles and rockets in the United States. They get moved to Huntsville, Alabama in 1950. It's Rocket City, USA. And in my book, I document Kennedy and Von Braun's meeting in 1953. And it's Von Braun who built the Saturn V that took us to the moon, uh, Hitler's um, rocketeer. Like I said. Some things you'd never guess. We all have heard his name before, of course, but it's an amazing story. Uh, of course, JFK figures prominently. He has the subtitle, of course, John F. Kennedy and the Great Space Race. Uh, I've read plenty on Kennedy. I'm, probably you have, too. It's the most supple biography I've read about um, Kennedy so far, things about him I never knew about him, and also what a vulnerable guy he often was, that he was not the guy, of course, picked for greatness. His brother was. His rise to power was not at all inevitable, despite his dad's money and power. And he defied the odds again and again and again to get to the White House, of course, and then within that realm to champion NASA, to create NASA, create the NASA that we know today. So his story is an amazing one. And I was shocked to learn that his ties also to this involve his brother's death and his own feeling that his own life will not live, be that long. Well, that, you know, John F. Kennedy served very nobly in World War II in the South Pacific. Some of you might know the Solomon Islands campaign and the famous PT-109 incident when Kennedy's boat split in half, uh, uh, runs in at night into a Japanese ship. Um, crewmen die, Kennedy saves lives, uh, and he becomes a war hero, young John F. Kennedy. Um, and he came back to America and he would run for Congress. You know, the one thing I want you to know about John F. Kennedy, you all think of him as an orator or handsome, debonair, or whatever you think of him. Um, but he, he hated losing. He never lost. His dad used to browbeat him if he got a second place in a boat race. Who got number one? We don't do second. And so John F. Kennedy in his political career never lost an election. He won Congress in 1946 from Massachusetts, again in 1948, again in 1950. He ran for the Senate in 1952 and ran and won. He ran for the Senate in 1958 and won, and he ran for the presidency in 1960, our youngest elected president in American history. That's the kind of hubris John F. Kennedy had in drive that he had, but his brother was his hero, and his brother was a naval aviator in Europe for the U.S., and his brother died in Operation Aphrodite, in which we would take Navy planes and pack it with tour packs, which is like TNT, from nose you know, um, to tail, and Kennedy flew it, and it was aiming to be like a drone and to crash into the warehouse sites of Werner von Braun's vengeance weapons, and his brother blew up in the sky. Uh, he was gonna parachute out the last minute, but something happened. Uh, wire loose or whatever, and it went. They, we could barely find any even um, uh, rubble 
And so Kennedy lost his brother trying to take out Werner von Braun's missiles. And here they are, they meet in 1953 together as Time Magazine's um, um, judges for person of the year. And all Kennedy did when he went out around New York with von Braun is kept talking about how his brother died trying to destroy your missiles. And they became great friends. And um, they chose Conrad Adenauer as Time's Man of the Year. He was the new chancellor of West Germany. And the reason why von Braun got kind of whitewashed in America, people weren't holding him accountable for war crimes and, um, and crimes against humanity. He, he did a PR job. His first speech he gave in El Paso, Texas, von Braun was to the Rotary Club uh, where he talked about going to the moon and Mars. He hit his World War II experience, and then Walt Disney discovered him and put Von Braun on his TV show throughout the 1950s. And Von Braun became the space guy of tomorrow, and Kennedy thought, saw him as a space celebrity. And um, uh, I, Dwight Eisenhower, president, didn't like Von Braun because of his Nazi past, but Kennedy figured, I was a young guy, I fought in the Pacific for America, he's German, he fought for Germany, and our new big allies in the Cold War of the 1950s are Japan and West Germany. So he held no grudge against von Braun. It's an amazing story there, too. Amazing relationship right to the very end. They're very close. Uh, two unsung heroes, largely, are LBJ and James Webb. He'll talk about that, I'm sure. But of course, these sung heroes are the astronauts. What was great about reading about their biographies in your book, fresh stuff, original stuff, even if you read the right stuff and so on, this is new material. Uh, these guys were absolutely the real deal. And in our line of work, of course, he interviews astronauts, and I investigate Notre Dame football players. <laughs> so it turns out the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Grantland Rice, famous lead, are uh, pestilence. What do we have here? Famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. I looked up that game. They beat Army 13 to 7. That is not death and destruction. That's two field goals. <laughs> That's, it's not that impressive. I'm sorry. So sometimes you look back in the past and you find out it's not that big a deal. In this case, when you look back at these guys and you interview these guys as well, these guys are absolutely the real deal. Character, toughness, intelligence, amazing resilience, and actual real togetherness. Well, they are astronaut core. I mean, the, the key point, as you all know, is the Cold War. And from 1945 to 1949, it's the only time in world history where one country has a nuclear monopoly, the United States. And we felt good, we're the superpower. We have nuclear weapons, nobody else does. And lo and behold, the Soviet Union got the atomic bomb. And then they got the hydrogen bomb. And the Russians put up the first intercontinental ballistic missile, an ICBM, the R-7. And then in October 1957, they put up the first satellite with Sputnik in October. And Sputnik was the size of a basketball with big antenna that went around, uh, and the America panicked. We are losing everything to Russia. There still was no human in space, but we felt we were, there was a missile. John F. Kennedy, as a senator, creates the term missile gap with Russia, space lag. And we, uh, the Democrats, Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and others beat up on Eisenhower for being asleep at the wheel and forced Eisenhower in 1958 to create NASA as civilian space exploration. And by 1959, we're ready to name who our first space travelers were be, and it's the Mercury 7 astronauts. Uh, Life magazine told their life stories, and there was grand introductions of their things. They became like knights of American exceptionalism to prove that the United States was as good as the Soviet Union in technology, that democratic capitalism was equal and better than um, totalitarian communism. And, but yet we never put a astronaut into space in the late 50s, and Kennedy runs on space. The famous Kennedy-Nixon debates of 1960 were the first presidential debates in US history. Lincoln-Douglas is an Illinois game, you know. The only time presidents debated was 60, and it was on television, and there were four, and the Kennedy scores his best points on space against Nixon. At one point, he says to Nixon, you told Mr. Khrushchev, the Soviet premier, you told Mr. Khrushchev that the United States is number one in kitchen appliances, and, um, and we have color TV. 
Well, I'll take my TV in black and white, thank you. I want to be number one in rocket thrust. Mm -hmm. And then another moment in the debate, Kennedy says to Nixon, if you're elected, I see a Soviet flag planted on the moon. I want an American flag planted on the moon. And Kennedy gets elected by a hair in 1960. He does that famous Ask Not inaugural, you all know. And then lo and behold, in April 61, only a couple months in the White House, the Soviets put the first human in space, Yuri Gagarin, cosmonaut. And it happens on Jack Kennedy's watch, and he's livid. And in White House meetings, he is really browbeating his national security advisor and aides. How do we leapfrog the Soviets? I want to leapfrog them. We've got to do something big to beat them in space. And, and he also pushed to finally get a Mercury astronaut up because we were worried about some of the tech, whether we didn't want a dead astronaut, to put it bluntly. And um, we, on May 5th, 1961, put our first counterstatement to Gagarin, and that's Mercury astronaut Alan Shepard of New Hampshire, whose family hailed from the Mayflower. Shepard's only up 15 minutes, comes down, and he becomes an overnight folk hero. And it's that very month of May 61, on the 25th, that Kennedy surprises Americans goes to a joint session of Congress in Washington and makes the, the pledge we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade and bring him back alive. And you know what they thought at NASA? you got to be kidding me. <laughs> We've got no technology to go to the moon. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower, for ex-president now, called it a, a four, it'll be a $40 billion stunt. It was $25 billion stunt, but it was a, but he said it'll be a $40 billion uh, stunt and criticized it. And McGeorge Bundy, Kennedy's own national security advisor, pigeonholed his boss and Critis said, what are you doing saying we're going to the moon? And Kennedy said, Mac, you've got to have some moxie to run for president in your 40s. Um, John F. Kennedy's father was desperately looking for a son after the speech, calling the White House secretary, where's Jack? God, I knew he'd do something dumb and reckless like this. <laughs> and um, so it, it, Kennedy's now leading this. A bit, and at, with, uh, during his presidency, we put up six Mercury missions. Mercury is all one astronaut. Gemini is two. Apollo, three. The goal, the moon. And while Kennedy's alive, we put up six Mercury missions. Six of those Mercury seven go up. Only Deke Slayton didn't. And they all became space heroes. Uh, the most famous um, being John Glenn of Ohio. But there's also Gordon Cooper and Wally Schirra and Scott Carpenter and, and Gus Grissom. And they all became um, Kennedy's space corps. Kennedy loved special ops. He created the U.S. SEALs. He created the Green Beret. Uh, and he had these now Mercury astronauts, which were he saw as almost an extension of his presidency. Like I said, see? <laughs> it's an amazing story because we think we know it, but we don't. And how we got to the starting line, really, with Apollo, just to get that far was an amazing story. I didn't realize it. I knew we were behind, of course, Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin. I didn't realize they were basically behind for six or seven years Constantly, every first was the Soviets, not the Americans, of course. So get this. I also didn't realize this. Yuri Gagarin, Bay of Pigs, and Alan Shepard's first flight all occur within 24 days. That is a busy month. <laughs> and you get some sense of how tense the whole experience was. And of course, during Jack Kennedy's presidency alone, you've got the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin Wall, the airlift. All this happens. So the sideshow basically is the Apollo program. So this is how we express ourselves uh, during this time. So I got it. You already mentioned one of them. Delicious details. These are the things that, thank God, Douglas did not cut, because I know he had to cut a lot of stuff to make this book work. But here's a fun one. Uh, the phrase moonshot comes from baseball. Explain. <laughs> well, the, you know, we all use the term moonshot, and it began in the late 1950s uh, with a baseball player named Wally Moon of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And he was playing in the L.A. Coliseum, and they would hit these towering home runs over the you know, left field fence, and Vince Scully, a radio announcer, would go, oh, there it is, going back, back, it's, oh, it's a moonshot. And it became popularized out in Los Angeles with the broadcasting and got picked up nationally. Uh, NASA starts using the term for their manned space center in Houston 
which is determined in the, in the early 60s, that, that's it. And it first is called the Moonshot Command Post. Today we call it the Johnson Mann Space Center in NASA. But the term moonshot now on the 50th anniversary um, stands for can, American can doism. And everybody's hoping, uh, uh, the idea that our, our society can pull together instead of this Democrat Republican divide and all the ugliness, we work together as Americans, do something big short of war. So, you know, I, Buzz Aldrin, I was just with Michael Collins, one of the Apollo 11 astronauts. They think the next moonshot needs to be a Mars shot where we go to Mars. Uh, Joe Biden running for president right now wants the new moonshot to be a war on cancer. There are people that say the new moonshot should be an earth shot to deal with climate change. I can go on. The point is that word now means pulling together and getting something big done uh, as Americans uh, that unites our country and doesn't divide us. And it starts with Wally Moon. He mentioned, of course, and I did not realize this, that the first presidential debates were, in fact, 1960, not as televised. I learned that, of course, but first ever. That was amazing to me. Here are some fun facts for you from the uh, NASA training. Uh, they pounded jets of ice water fired into their ears every, at 10-second intervals. That'll weed out a lot of guys right there. And perhaps the most shocking one, all these guys had to swallow a two-foot rubber hose. I got a lot of jokes, but I'm not going <laughs> to tell them. But that shows you the guys who survived this process. It sounds like frat hazing at some point, yeah. honestly. So. The endurance tests were brutal to be a Mercury or Gemini or Apollo astronaut. But I, um, just to pivot off that, I write in my book, you know, we've had 12 moonwalkers now after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and others uh, followed, but we still have yet to have a woman on the moon. So when we go back, we need to have the first woman on the moon. And that may be, and the, I, I write in my book about the Mercury 13. 13 women did train to become astronauts. They were extraordinary pilots and they passed all of Dr. Randy Lovelace's endurance tests. In fact, many of them had better uh, statistics of endurance than the male astronauts. John Glenn was in a weird league of his own. It's a whole other story. I don't know, he's like, uh, his, uh, his, meaning your pulse, your heart rate and all of this. But the last minute, no, they wouldn't allow the women on gender bias back then. There were people in the Kennedy administration saying, let's get a, put a woman in the space. Uh, John Glenn testified a subcommittee, no, we don't want women. And the trick of keeping women out of becoming astronauts was you had to have logged um, avi military aviation, combat experience, and flight experience. Well, if women weren't allowed to be pilots in the military in the Korean War, you couldn't log those hours, so they found a way not to have them. So unfortunately, Russia got another first. They put the first woman astronaut in space. Um, but we went into space with a woman, Sally Ride, some of you remember? What a great person she was. She went up in 1983, and then um, now it, it's not just a cracked glass ceiling for women, it's shattered. There are women astronauts all over. It's a robust field um, for um, going to college and study aeronautics or um, uh, space science, D dream of being an astronaut. It's equal for women now, but it took a long time to get to that point. Um, so we, did, we do come a long ways with things, and when we hear about going back to the moon in four or five years or eight years, um, I'm sure we will have um, a female moonwalker, uh, which would only be right. Some more delicious details. Um, on page 182, Al Kaline. That's all I have to say about that. That's called pandering again. Barden's Wonder Freeze, Al Kaline. I'm sure I'll have one more here. Uh, John Glenn's wingman during the Korean War, none other than Ted Williams, the famous hitter, uh, who was, of course, quite a good uh, pilot himself, as was well known. So back to the story itself. Uh, February 20th, 1962, the 14th attempt by John Glenn to take the launch itself. That's how many times it was scratched before that, scrubbed as they call it in the business. Uh, that was a momentous day, and your depiction of this had me gripped. Well, John Glenn, um, you know, finally got a green light, and his the reason he was he was the Marine of the Mercury astronauts. You know, they tried to not get jealousy between the 
the armed um, service branches. So you'd go Navy, Air Force, Army, Marine, you know, trying to keep them all involved. And he was the Marine, um, John Glenn. But he went up in early 62 and almost died. He circled Earth five times. But on, upon re-entry, we lost communication with them and the heat shields started coming out. I'm not exaggerating that he lost like 15 pounds in space from sweating so much. He came back totally dehydrated. Uh, they was all, it was like an inferno inside that little capsule, uh, I, I, the Friendship 7. And once he's back, he is a ticker tape parade, giant hero. 1962 is the year that Seattle has its World's Fair and the Space Needle goes up. And we're all talking about space in America. And Glenn, politically, was an independent. Kennedy once was in a rocking chair in the White House with the astronauts, and out of nowhere he said to, the Mercury 7 were there, and Kennedy says, so I hear you guys, except for Glenn, are Republicans. And they all looked at each other, and Gus Grissom said, I don't know what the hell we are. We're just like a motley bunch. And they laughed, but Kennedy globs on to John Glenn, and he becomes almost an extended member of the Kennedy family. Uh, he becomes Robert Bobby Kennedy's great pal. Glenn becomes a Democratic senator eventually from Ohio. But when I interviewed Ethel Kennedy, the widow for, of RFK, Bobby Kennedy, when Bobby was murdered in Los Angeles and laying there, Sirhan Sirhan killed him, uh, she has to leave her husband's dead body there with blood all over and quickly sneaks a telephone call in. And you know who she called? John Glenn. Uh, she called Glenn to go to Hickory Hill, um, her home in Northern Virginia, to look after her children because he had become like a family member and had such a calm demeanor about him that he would be able to talk to her children while she was um, having to deal with that uh, horrific event there. So Glenn and Kennedy, and they used to travel around um, Bobby and uh, Ethel Kennedy and the Glens would go to Palm Springs and Florida together on trips. They had become that close. Uh, on that attempt, of course, that one worked, the 14th try, uh, John Glenn called his wife beforehand, this is from the book, of course, and said, don't be scared. Remember, I'm just going down to the corner store to get a pack of gum. Uh, <laughs> these guys truly had ice in their veins, and despite that inferno, as you described, uh, his heart rate did not increase. That's what these guys were made of, naturally. Uh, how much did it grip America? 45 million TVs, about a third of the country at that point, was uh, tuned into this. Um, in Detroit, uh, the employees at Bell Telephone thought that the machines were not working because there no calls were being made. <laughs> They're all watching the launch, of course. In Grand Rapids, a judge and a jury were adjudicating on a stolen television case, and while the uh, per per perpetrator was there, they turned the TV on to watch the, the launch. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't you do that, right? <laughs> we'll take five minutes here. And you know what? Um, also, John, when, at that same time, everybody was watching Walter Cronkite on CBS News, and when the reporters swarmed, it was nail-biting, like whether Glenn died or not, and he's alive and he's saved, and the reporters swarmed around um, uh, Glenn's, um, John Glenn's mother, and they said, oh, my God, you must be, are you so excited to meet and reunite with your son. And she said, well, I'm really excited I'm gonna to get to meet Walter Cronkite. Uh, <laughs> I need to add here, by the way, Douglas also wrote a best-selling book about Walter Cronkite, so he knows his turf. Uh, my all-time favorite, though, same day, same uh, launch. Uh, in Trent, New Jersey, a bank robber successfully robbed a bank of $9,000 on his way out. He decides to stop at a bar. The launch is on TV. Heck, I'll watch this. <laughs> and while he's watching, he gets caught. <laughs> so that's uh, how it captivated the nation. One last one. And I, this is, by the way, doing what I do for a living, trying to do what Doug does, of course. The, the level of research and detail is phenomenal and knowing what to keep in and what to put in the archives, of course. Uh, in 1962, the Mets, brand new team, of course, New York Mets, replacing the Dodgers and the Giants from five years earlier, are coached by uh, Casey Stengel, of course, known for his irascible personality. They are, you not only mentioned that they're in spring training working on something, but they're doing the leadoff play, how to do the leadoff play. That level of detail is incredible. And during the leadoff play drill, he says, let's take a break and watch the launch. That team lost 120 games that year. 
so I don't think it mattered too much, ultimately. Uh, a big shocker to me, so I, I, we all hear about the space race, of course, and so on. I did not know that several times JFK reached out privately and publicly to the Soviets to try to pull this thing off together. So it might not have been a race, it might have been cooperation at some point, but Khrushchev always said no. Well, and the reason what, what Kennedy got worried about after the Cuban Missile Crisis where we almost went to war, um, a nuclear war perhaps with Russia, um, I don't know if you realize that the Cuban Missile Crisis got defused because Bobby Kennedy met with the Soviet ambassador and made a deal that in a year, we would, if they would not dismantle their launch sites in Cuba, Russia, we would remove our Jupiter missiles from Turkey that were pointed at the Soviet Union. Those were Werner von Braun Jupiter missiles um, there in um, Turkey. And many of the Vanguard missiles built by the Navy used to collapse. If you see them at, on footage, you'll see them collapse. Von Braun's rockets, whether a Jupiter or a Saturn, they were always flawlessly um, engineered. And um, you know the the you know big takeaway from the, the the reason that the Soviets didn't want to do anything. I mentioned that Khrushchev's son, Sergei Khrushchev, um, said later would say that I my I asked my dad, would Russia, would we really, Dad, go to the moon with America? And Khrushchev said never. And the son said why? And Khrushchev said because then the Americans will know what we don't have. Um, we did our we filmed our launches. Everything Russia did was in secret at Star City and in Kazakhstan. And so they were boasting a lot about their technology, Russia, when all of it wasn't really what they said it was going to be. And a collaborative effort uh, would not have been in their interest. And in the United States, it would have gotten defunded if we went with Russia because we were selling it for Cold War politics. It cost $25 billion for the Apollo project. That's $180 billion today. And the reason it's so bipartisan is Democrats like big government projects. FDR, the Grand Coulee Dam, and Tennessee Valley Authority, and, and dams and the like. Um, the, you have uh, Dwight Eisenhower built the interstate highway system on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Kennedy puts it all on um, space and technology corridors around the country, so Democrats are into it. Republicans don't want to be seen as weak on communism. So if Kennedy wanted to tell a Republican senator, oh, you don't want to go to the moon, so you want the Soviets to beat us to the moon, senator. No, I didn't say that. I didn't, you know, in that Cold War climate, it pulled everybody together, and Kennedy sold it, as, you're, you're talking about sports a lot, at my university, I read the original draft of Kennedy's speech, and he writes in on his own at the last minute, you know, they say, why do we go to the moon? Why did Mallory climb Mount Everest? Why does Rice play Texas in football? <laughs> it's, it's a challenge, you know. And, uh, but he would frame it in kind of football win um, metaphors in his speeches in order to keep that funding going. And when Kennedy's assassinated in Dallas in 1963, he was on his way to give a speech about space, how many satellites we have put up, how many uh, weather reconnaissance and telecommunications and how we now are, are winning in the race uh, of, of rocket train on, on our way to the moon. And alas, he never got to give that speech. He did not, of course. We know that. And we also, we also of course, know that he did not see the moon landing. However, in this book, uh, Douglas has got that unread speech. Uh, in full. It's incredible. It's a beautiful speech. So in that speech, it's very clear that JFK already knew that, that the Americans were ahead of the Soviets in the space race. He at least saw that, and not by much, but the U.S. was definitely unequivocally ahead at that stage. Um, and as you also wrote in this book, which also surprised me, that his death might have actually guaranteed the mission. Well, the day before Kennedy was killed, he was in San Antonio, Texas, giving a, spe a, a space speech where all about the spin-off technology. Basically, if you're Kennedy's audience here, he was saying to you, you say $25 billion is a lot of money. Well, you know what? We're just in medicine alone. We're getting CAT scans and MRI, kidney, di uh, um, kidney dialysis machines, heart defibrillators, football, the foam and helmet for to, to, you know, for con to uh, hopefully reduce concussions the suits that fire people wear for fire resistance. Uh, you know, he, he rattled off all that you're getting taxpayers for your money, and it was true. 
Um, once he's killed in Dallas, um, the big moment, you know, Jackie Kennedy wore the pink Chanel suit and blood all over her. And, you know, she got uh, stood when Lyndon Johnson got sworn in on Air Force One. Kennedy gets buried at Arlington National Cemetery, John Glenn participating in all of that ceremony. And then Jackie gets to meet the new president in the Oval Office her first time. Lyndon and Johnson and Lady Bird was there. And she has one request. She says to Lyndon Johnson, I want Jack's dream, the moonshot dream alive, kept alive. And Lyndon says, we will. And, um, and, and he said, you know what, We're, we decided, if, if it's okay with you, to Jackie, uh, Johnson said, we want to name Kennedy, they named Cape Canaveral the Kennedy Space Center. And she said, that would be great. And then my book, I document Jackie Kennedy's co uh, correspondence with Warner Von Braun as Von Braun's racing to build the moon rocket in Huntsville, Alabama. But in the mid-1960s on the Kennedy effect, NASA got 4.4% of our annual federal budget, 4.4%. Today it gets a third of 1%. And so they used to say in NASA, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. Um, and it almost gets derailed going to the moon, um, um, except uh, particularly in 1967, when we have an Apollo 1 rocket that's going to do a test exercise and three of our astronauts blow up in a fireball and we lose Gus Grissom and um, Roger Chafee and Ed White. And with the three dead Apollo astronauts, people rightfully were saying, why the end of the decade? What's so, ma just because Kennedy said by the end of the decade, what's so magical about it? James Webb, who I write about, the head of NASA in the Kennedy-Johnson years, re re resigns. And there's a feeling Apollo might get defunded, but it had enough gas in its tank. So 50 years ago, Richard Nixon was president, and he was continuing with Apollo. And he's the president of record um, when we finally had that success of going to the moon. Keep in mind, as Armstrong told me, that he thought they had a 50-50 chance of being successful. Not dying, but just that they could pull it off. Um, now that we know it worked, we all, you know, um, are, uh, honor it and celebrate it. But it was we, we lost a lot of good people in trying to, in our space program and in aviation out at test pilots out in Edwards Air Force Base and the like. Uh, um, and so there's a lot uh, we need to, on the 50th, remember people who died in the space program. And we did that on the moon. Because if you know, you're all going to be watching this week or, you know, or watching documentaries. Neil Armstrong, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. He wrote that line himself on his, um, he test marketed on his brother. What you're not going to be focused, except I might be mentioning now, is at the very end, the clock's running. We, they've got moon rock and lunar dust and they got to get out of the moon. Um, and onto the Eagle and then reconnect with the mothership Columbia, you will hear um, at that moment Armstrong say to Aldrin, did you leave the packet? And suddenly in that bulky suit, you see all Armstrong, or Aldrin left something there. On that site in the moon, incidentally, if all of our audience, we went back there today, it would look exactly like it was. There's no wind on the moon, so it would be like an, a, exactly like it was on July, you know, July 20th, 1969, except the American flag, the red and blue colors of the flag have turned almost white due to ultraviolet rays. But otherwise, someday it will be a national park. It'll be like the moon, moon base, tranquility based national park where you'll see the, uh, the, the footprints of the first time humans broke the shackles of planet Earth. But in that moment when he said, you leave the packet, in that packet were medals honoring are Apollo 1 astronauts who had died in 67. And in that same packet were medals honoring the Soviet cosmonauts who died in their space program, including Yuri Gagarin, who later died in an uh, uh, um, aviation accident uh, working on a, in the space program and, and died there. So there's a Gagarin medal on the American site on the moon because without Russia to compete in peace, for all, man, all civilization, without the peaceful aspect of the competition, we wouldn't have funded it or gotten to the moon, so we paid our proper respects to Russia for spurring us forward.
Talk a little bit about what NASA did in fact do for us as JFK promised as well as the final legacy here. Uh, what NASA did not do for us despite common misconception and that is including mine. Uh, the NASA program did not invent Velcro, Teflon, or Tang. <laughs> I don't know how much Tang I pounded as a five-year-old kid in Ann Arbor, <laughs> assuming that all they, but they did use all these things. They certainly popularized those things. However, the list, and Doug's got this in the book, the list of various fields this project did spur is incredible. You already mentioned, of course, uh, kidney dialysis, which is amazing. Uh, cordless power tools. We all have those. Uh, Barcoding, we use that every day, of course, in the grocery stores. Uh, and of course, naturally, computers. Computer science programs boomed across the nation during the 60s, and that is why we're also had another field, of course, high tech. Absolutely. You know, I knew when I started my book that um, NASA was sort of the gateway to the technology revolution of the Silicon Valley. Um, I, it, it also was the last act of World War II, Apollo 11. Um, it was only 15 years after World War II ended in 1960, and um, there was still in our society this notion of high risk, hurry up things, collective work of academia, academicians with the federal government, with the private sector, and it kind of got godfathered in. Although the pilots were Korean War veterans, people like Armstrong, Glenn, Shira, the uh, management level people served in World War II, uh, including James Webb, who was running our radar, which is a brand new World War II innovation uh, for the Marines in the Pacific against Japan. So we ought to remember that 60, when Kennedy's elected, World War II was only 50, uh, 15 years old. But the big technological breakthrough was in the late 50s when Texas Instruments in Dallas created a guy, Jack Kirby, the microchip there which NASA adopts, and we start using, NASA becomes the applied science of computer technology. And as John said, in 1960, I noticed they did not have computer science classes at universities. You couldn't be a computer science major at a college university. By 63, they were everywhere. But it was the beginning of the computer age with NASA taking the lead, and also in 1960, hate to keep telling you Time Magazine's person of the year, but it was scientist in 1960. There's this window of the Kennedy early, you know, that part of the 60s that our society thought scientists were gonna solve all of our problems. Um, by the end of the 60s and early 70s, we didn't feel that way about scientists anymore because of Agent Orange and Vietnam War and Dow Chemical and Rachel Carson and DDT and its pesticides, and there became a kind of attack on the science community. So Kennedy was very lucky to be windowing this right when computer science was making this kind of moonshot plausible. When you think back about the legacy of the moonshot, thanks to Wally Moon, of course, uh, a few things come to mind. It's one of the few times you pointed out earlier where left and right were utterly bonded uh, in this mission and probably our greatest triumph period where outside of war, of course. War unifies us, 9-11 unifies us. This unified us without a war, without a tragedy, uh, a positive triumph, which is pretty incredible. Uh, on the plaque, of course, in that pack, they also dropped a plaque which said, we came in peace for all mankind. And that remains with the white flag, of course. Uh, on the moon. And one of the thoughts that Doug has near the end of the book is really, it really hit me. How many times do we say in the course of a day, if we can put a man on the moon, we can blank? <laughs> it is the standard for everything else we think about. If we can do that, we can do anything. That is the spirit involved. Kennedy was right about the spiritual aspect, if you will, about how it's going to affect our society forever. And it now occurs to me, too, that a thousand years from now, if they remember American society at all, the first thing they remember is that we went to the moon. That will always be something that will be part of our history uh, long after almost everything else. So that's a pretty incredible story, to say the least. George Will said about Ken Burns, proud Ann Arbor High graduate, uh, that, um, that the Civil War, of course, our national tragedy, has finally found its homer. Our greatest triumph, the American moonshot, has found its homer as well, Douglas Brinkley. Thank you. Thank you.
And speaking of all that, we have got an astronaut in our midst who's also known as your neighbor, I believe. Captain Jerry Lininger, please come on up here. That is how an astronaut mounts the stage. <laughs> I'll give you a brief background to save time for Jerry's remarks. Jerry spent nearly five months on the Russian space station Mir for peace in 1997. He survived the most severe fire ever aboard an orbiting spacecraft and other life-threatening events, which he eloquently wrote about in his book, Off the Planet. In completing this treacherous mission, Leininger logged 50 million miles... That is equivalent to 100 round trips around the moon. To put it in perspective, in 2008, he was awarded by NASA a Distinguished Service Medal, their highest honor. Without further ado, Captain Jerry Leininger. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to tell you, when I joined the astronaut corps in 1992, they were still shooting ice water into our eardrums <laughs> in this spinning torture machine and doing lots of those tests and putting tubes in every orifice that they could find. Mm -hmm. And were they two feet? I can't say for certain because I did not want to see it. I just <laughs> let them do it and hope I qualified. So some things never change. Um, you know, Ron Jolly, our extraordinary uh, disc jockey and our, uh, you know, keeps us informed here, sent me an email the other day, and he wanted two questions for his radio show, and I said, you know, I think I'll answer those tonight because he knows the right questions. And the two questions he had is, where were you when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon's surface? And then how did that event uh, influence your future in the space program? And I was 14 years old, and I was on a camping trip up in Canada on the shore of Lake Huron, and I'm looking up at the moon, and I say, man, our guys are up there. And I went to a little campground area where everyone was gathered. This guy had a generator, really noisy, black and white TV set, as you were mentioning. And I was small enough that I crawled right in front, my brother and I, and we watched, you know, Man on the Moon. And I can remember Walter Cronkite with a tear in his eye saying, you know, we are on the moon. And I said, this event is something special. It's making Walter Cronkite tear up. And I want to do that someday. And I went home, blue collar neighborhood, Detroit. Dad drove a telephone truck, five kids in the family, went up to my dad, and I said, Dad, I want to be an astronaut someday. And my dad could have said, you know, forget it, Jerry. You know, set your sights on something more realistic. Uh, but he didn't. My dad, somebody I always respected, you know, put his arm around me, said, Jerry, this is America. You work hard, you study hard be anything you set your mind to. And I think about that now, I was thinking in the context of what you're talking about here uh, this afternoon and evening, and I think he said that because he was part of that, you know, greatest generation. He had fought in World War II. Uh, his best friend Jerry uh, fought alongside him. Best friend Jerry didn't make it back. That's my namesake. People say, are you Jerome? Are you Gerald? No, I'm Jerry. Uh, named after my dad's buddy. Uh, he saw us get to the moon. He saw us do these incredible things. And so he was there to pat me on the back and said, you know, you can do anything you set your mind to, because America can do anything we set our mind to. And we talk about all the tangibles and all the spin-offs and all the, you know, things that we get out of our space program, but we forget about those intangibles. And that intangible was what set me on my, my course of my life, and being privileged and lucky to represent you all in space as an astronaut. Uh, but everyone else, the computers, the kids working hard, I've got two of my uh, children here, not children, young, young adults here with me. You know, inspiration, you know, that's what, that's what it gave us, going to the moon. We have gone to the moon. One other thought I had listening to things, I'm thinking when I was back at the World Economic Forum in Davos, I gave a keynote address there, and then in an evening panel, they had some chairs out, and there were about seven of us, and I was the space science guy. They had Francis Collins, who was running NIH at that time. He's talking about medical things. 
And the question they posed to the seven panelists was, what's the greatest accomplishment of the 20th century? And Francis Collins said, well, I'll tell you, antibiotics and the development of antibiotics was incredible. But he's the guy that did the human genome. And he said, figuring out the genetics of a human being is probably the greatest accomplishment uh, that took place in the 20th century. And for me, what do you think I would say? <laughs> you know, no, no, Francis, it's the space program. We went to the moon in that decade, which is incredible, putting a time frame on that. And aviation and what happened with the Wright brothers and the acceleration of technology, World War I, especially in World War II, jet engines, all the things that had to happen to put us in the moon, onto the moon and to put myself up into space orbiting the planet. And then there was uh, other people saying all kinds of interesting stuff, but there was a European guy there that shocked me, and I end up saying, this guy's right, I think he wins. He figured out what the greatest accomplishment of the 20th century was. And his take on it was the benevolence, the benevolence of the United States of America after our victories in wars in that century. You know, he said we could have taken territory, we could have, you know, pushed people down, we could have held them down. Instead, we rebuilt Europe, rebuilt Japan, made them competitors of ours. We didn't colonize, we didn't do all those evil things. And I'll tell you, in this world today, I guess my, my final thought, and this book will help inspire that, uh, my final thought is, you know, we still need to choose to do hard things. And our space program forces us to push our technology. And you might not have the Russian, I lived a couple years over there, you might not have that Cold War tension, but you've definitely got, and I've got that grand view of the world, looking at the global picture, trust me, out in space for five months. <laughs> you've definitely got competition on the technology front. And if anybody is gonna advance the technology, and if any country in this world uh, is going to have that absolute power, you know, I go back to those words of the benevolence of the United States of America. And I sure hope it's our country that continues to lead, continues to push technology, and continues to uh, move mankind forward. Um, I will just say this, you know, it's an honor representing you all in space. I try to represent you well every moment up there. I said, I am representing mankind. We're moving mankind forward, and I'm going to do the best I can to represent you all well and also to carry on the legacy of those coins that are planted on the moon of all the astronauts that gave their lives before me. Um, so fantastic being here, fantastic being part of this tonight. Jerry. 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 That's it. I do have one follow-up question, however. Uh, in your description of the famous moment, of course, in July of 69, you mentioned that you're a 14-year-old kid. That makes him nine years older than I am. I just saw you jump on that stage. <laughs> hey, John, you need to move to northern Michigan. It's a good lifestyle up here. Good, clean water. So my follow-up question is, what exactly are you drinking? <laughs> <laughs> and it is that fine Michigan water. You know, I was, I was backpacking once, I just at Sleeping Bear Sand Dunes. I said at night, hey, I think He's I'm going to go backpack. So I go down there, and I ask the ranger as I'm leaving, I say, okay, I'm going to camp one night, and I'm going to hike back. And he says, fine. And, he, and I said, oh, one last thing, Where's the, what's the drinking water source? And he says, you go out into that lake, go about waist deep, reach down about as deep as your knee, and drink. No need to treat. And we do that at our house in Sutton's Bay. Anyone that comes to our house, the inauguration, that they have to, you know, to break them in, the initiation, I should say, is to swim out, go underwater about three foot deep, and be <laughs> like a fish and drink the water. So it's the water, John. There we so. go. Thank you, Jerry.
I, I have a question. Why don't you guys run it for Congress or the Senate? <laughs> There you go. The Captain Laninger three foot water test. We got a place in Torch Lake. Thank my grandfather bought it 60 years ago for 5,000 bucks. You can't do that now, I don't think. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, that test is a little bit tough. Jerry, it beats the hose test. So <laughs> lucky for that. I grew we up near Toledo and Lake Erie. We couldn't do the water test when I grew up. <laughs> It's a little tougher down there. Uh, speaking of tough, by the way, before we get on to the Q&A, and we are now ready for Q&A, so if you've got a question, by all means, raise your hand. We'll send a microphone uh, holder over to you uh, as fast as we can. But while we do that, uh, you need to know, by the way, that our man here, the good professor Brinkley, is playing hurt. He uh, managed to uh, fracture his patella about a month ago, and he sucked it up right stuff style, and he's here tonight. So well done. Go to uh, this man right here in the middle. Sir. Sounds like it's working. Uh, I read a little bit about uh, some of the uh, machinations that went on uh, about how they were going to you know, get to the moon and that Werner Braun, uh, as I understand it, was proposing an even huger missile to do that and to back down onto the moon. And there was someone, and I can't, I can't recall who it was, that eventually uh, came up with the ideas that wasn't really an insider with NASA. Did you touch at all about yeah, that? Um, it's a great question. Um, Von Braun wanted to do a Nova rocket, he called it that. Would, the rocket itself would go to the moon. Um, and a man named John Hobolt, H-O-U-B-O-L-T, uh, out of Langley, Virginia, Hampton, Virginia, had come up with this um, engineering concept of that spider-like looking Eagle module that you'd break away from a mothership and then you would, that would land on the earth and then it'd come back up and rendezvous. Now the problem with that approach and what Von Braun at first thought this wouldn't work, that um, the problem with his plan, they feared you couldn't afford to be 20 seconds late or you couldn't afford to um, just barely miss because they could not have a second chance if it didn't go over right the first time. But they decided on that, um, and it w that's the, the genius of NASA in the 60s was that approach. The Soviets never figured it out. Um, they were trying to put tortoises on the moon about late 1960s. Um, they don't bring their animals back alive, incidentally, Russia. They did the first creature like a dog in the late 50s, and it incinerated in space. Um, um, and the, you know, the, there was no, they didn't care. They would just kind of put creatures up. We were always worried about re-entry, how to bring what we, and so when people ask about going to Mars, we're never gonna do man, uh, man or woman on Mars until we know we can bring our astronaut, um, you know, back alive. But uh, there are many unsung heroes of going to the moon and he is one of them. Armstrong, what I, early I started my talk, told you guys how Ray Tyson Armstrong was not to talk to me, but to any reporters, because he felt he was just one astronaut and was hundreds of thousands of engineers, technicians, specialists that got us to the moon. And, um, and they all started fit, wanting to fulfill Kennedy's pledge. And you know, I, I write in my book at the time when we finally, we got Aldrin, um, um, Armstrong and Collins, and they were safe aboard the Hornet in the South Pacific. At Mission Control in Houston, they flashed Kennedy's moon challenge on May 25th, 61 on the board, and underneath it put task accomplished 1969. We have another question here in the back. Sorry, you've got one, thank you. Sir. Yes. Uh, Michael Collins orbited the moon while Aldrin and Armstrong were making all the headlines in history. Whatever became of him, and why didn't he uh, get a chance to walk on the moon? Well, Michael Collins really had a very tough job because it was one thing, he was all alone once the eagle went to land on the moon, as you suggested, just circling. And he wrote a brilliant memoir, Michael Collins, about, wow, here I am just floating, and how, not just how surreal the loneliness was, and, these, and seeing 
on Earth so fragile just sitting there and knowing your crewmates are there on the moon and you have to wait to come. Um, when we got back, they all got back, Collins had a great career. Uh, he ran the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and he's the person who got the word space put in the National, it used to be National Air Museum, he got it National Air and Space Museum. So it's one of the most popular attractions on the mall um, to go see all of our space vehicles. Um, and then after he retired from that, he's living a very grand life right now. Um, a wonderful human being. Uh, I just did a program with him at the Kennedy Library where he's all robust about um, Mars and as a last gesture. Neil Armstrong's died and Buzz Aldrin is still with us and Collins has had a, a, a great, great career in NASA and he's been one of our really true outstanding American citizens. One of the greatest people I've ever met is Michael Collins. Wow. Uh On that one, I've got to ask a follow-up question. As a sports writer, usually, occasionally history and business, but it's often a bad idea to meet your heroes. You find out they're drunks, womanizers, louts, egomaniacs, etc. Oftentimes, just hang on to the baseball card and call it good <laughs> is the way to go. Uh, you, although there are some glorious exceptions, and I've had a chance to work with those guys, you had a chance to meet your heroes. What was that like? Armstrong was amazing, except I am a humanities professor, a historian, and Armstrong went to Purdue University and was a engineer. And a, the reason all these astronauts went to Purdue is that it's flat in Ohio, in Indiana. <laughs> and in early aviation, Purdue cleverly said, if you come here uh, as an undergraduate, you can also, when you get your diploma, get a pilot's license. And they had an airport on their campus. So Neil Armstrong, who lived in Ohio, would fly from West Lafayette. On the weekends, he could take a Purdue plane and fly it to his farm in Wapakoneta to log miles to get his pilot's license. Um, and so, and he's a bit, I can't get into why and how deep, but he's a real engineer focused. That's why they chose him. But I, in my interview with him, wanted I, I was doing well on his Korean War history, which he was the greatest generation, was re Tyson about, but I opened him up and I was feeling my wings. And I said, Mr. Armstrong, can I just ask you, on the days leading up to the launch of Apollo 11, did you ever just at night look up at the moon and say, my gosh, I'm gonna be standing on, that, on the moon looking down at Earth? No. <laughs> that, that was all I got from him. So I, I, I don't, I don't want to make it like I, you know, he was uh, a, a storyteller deluxe. Um, but um, he was, um, you know, he, there's just an incredible integrity and a great person. And so and it doesn't disappoint at all. NASA, when I did it, I, had a, I broke my rule. They said, do not ask him to sign anything. But I had a book that he did with the other two astronauts. I couldn't help myself. I said, will you sign this? I saw these couple NASA executives go, oh, you did the ask. But I have it now. And it's a great keepsake for me and one that I plan to give to my son. There you go. By the way, the, if, if you notice the voice of the man in the back was unusually sonorous. Uh, that's Ron Jolly, yeah. <laughs> uh, WTCM's own Ron Jolly. And I can tell you, being on Ron's show many times over the years, heads up with Ron because he actually reads the book. And in our business, that's very rare for an interviewer to actually read the book that thoroughly. So, Ron, good to see you again. Uh, we have time for some more questions here. Yes. Douglas, welcome to Traverse City from Michigan Writers, and welcome, John. I'm wondering if you can talk about the status of our our culture with recording our history, how we're doing on that. It seems many young people are not very interested in history or they need another way to become interested. Um, we don't have as many history museums or monies for libraries in that direction. Can, being the researcher that you are, can you just tell us what we need to do towards that? Well, we need to pay high school teachers more money. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we have to prioritize education. Um, I'm being serious about it, including teaching civics and geography and American history. Um, because, 
we're graduating uh, generations uh, without some of the basic fundamental building tools. And, uh, and though they're going to be your great history preservation advocates and the like of the future. The uh, problem that I love, you know, my, my late historian uh, who admired Doug um, Stanton's book so much, Stephen Ambrose, uh, once said to me, you know, you got to realize, he had a very gruff voice, the point of a historian is all we do is read other people's mail. <laughs> and uh, it, he was kind of right about that. We're always looking at reading other people's um, mail, but I, I love holding old letters and, and reading them in documents, and I'm afraid now people just delete and, you know, uh, that people, uh, it, it loses some of the immediacy of it when it's the, it just, di everything's just digitalization. So I still get a kick out of going back to the primary source at the Library of Congress or presidential library or the like and the thrill of getting to actually tangibly touch the documents. And by going to places, topography is a big deal. The great, we're at a book event, but Wallace Stegner is one of my favorite writers, a novelist. Stegner would always talk about going to the place. You, if I go to Independence, Missouri, I could start feeling Harry Truman, you know. You go to this part here, we were talking about Jim Harrison, the novelist, or Hemingway, or something. You could feel it when you visit places, and uh, so I hope um, the future historians don't think the answer is just on their laptop. Love that. Up, up in the balcony. Yes, we see you, by the way. Hi. I'm assuming that when you started this project, you had a good working knowledge of the space program already. So uh, during your research, what surprised you the most? Hmm. Good question. Very good. Um, I just, I, there are many. I mean, and I think I didn't realize, well, I, I, at the end, I didn't really ever know how deep Kennedy had touched NASA people. So by these, if you just cut to May, June of 1969, when it's figured out we're going to the moon, July. A lot of people wanted the rocket to be named the John F. Kennedy in NASA, and they had as surrogates Bill Moyers of PBS. Uh, we used to write for LBJ, and uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who had become a New York senator, so they were lobbying President Nixon to name it the John F. Kennedy, the rocket. And I saw a document that surprised me from H.R. Haldeman. Do any of you remember that name? <laughs> Nixon's White House Chief of Staff. The documents are in the Nixon Library in Yorba Belinda. Haldeman's writing about this to, to Nixon uh, and others in the administration. Do, um, do not name the rocket after John F. Kennedy. It's an NBC News ploy to liberalize the moon. <laughs> and, uh, and then in another Haldeman one, it said, you, if you name the rocket the Kennedy, the liberals will say, um, you, you didn't do enough, the moon should be renamed Kennedy. <laughs> Don't mention Kennedy. So Nixon wouldn't mention John F. Kennedy. Um, he did a fine job talking with the astronauts and all, but and he and the other thing that surprised me is how risky Apollo 11 was. I know all space exploration was. We just heard about the fire and I mean it's it's risky business. But I just didn't you know Nixon in the summer 50 years ago rightfully had William Sapphire, his speechwriter, write a letter about dead astronauts. I'm sorry Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, you know, and Michael Collins died today. Um, we really didn't know it was gonna be a success. Once it was, and NASA was confident, but you, you know, they were, you can watch them cheer when it's all done, anything can go wrong. And um, you know, Nixon then got all over it for a while. Um, but I was surprised how quickly we, after that success, we started defunding Apollo. You would have thought that we've been in the moon, let's keep going. We kind of went into retreat. And uh, that's why Mars is, you know, uh, it's today, right now, all of us here, if you wanted to go home tonight, you can look at the International Space Station and watch these incredible astronauts coming and going in our space station. You could watch our rover from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena on your screen on Mars. But we don't do it a whole lot. So uh, I keep wondering what's going to take to kind of, as mentioned, galvanize us again for the American spirit. It's good for the spirit of America, the, I think, the moonshot on the 50th anniversary. And hopefully uh, we will start looking at Mars again uh, in earnest. I think by 2040 we'll be in Mars, uh, maybe sooner. 
But um, I'm excited by learning more about our solar system. And there is ice on the moon, on the caps, and we can go so look at that water source, go into caves, and you know, we kind of just barely touched the moon and retreated. And uh, I, after all that momentum, I would have thought maybe more that we would have kept it going. Question in the back. Well, actually, I was going to ask the question about uh, William Sapphire. Uh, it was in the Washington Post today. Um, but I, I guess the uh, uh, question I would ask is, uh, like looking forward, did you see the potential of going to Mars as the, as the next step? Well, I, we didn't get to it, but there's, as I know all of you know here, there's NASA, and then there's privatization of space. So many companies, there's, you know, Blue Origin is Jeff Bezos of Amazon's company, and Elon Musk is SpaceX. So people are starting to look at reusable rockets, space tourism, but the big thing would be Mars, and it may not be the United States alone, it might be us working with other countries, maybe China and the United States go to Mars together, who knows, but I do think it's important that we start funding NASA more and start taking it a little more seriously. We have 2,000 satellites up in there now. Every day, new satellites are going up. Whether you like it or not, or I like it or not, we're living in a satellite society. And, um, and you know, it's important to make sure we keep our equipment and our, our focus, I think, uh, on that. Yet, we have so many earthbound problems, and I do worry about uh, environmental pr uh, problems of our oceans and of our lakes and rivers and, and drought and and things like that. So it's always the problem of prioritization and funding, and it's a, it's a challenge. If we had a magic wand, though, I wish right now we could be gearing up uh, for Mars. Musk wants to go directly to Mars. Incidentally, Bezos uh, says, moon, use it as a launch pad for Mars. Debates go on in that realm. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping on the 50th anniversary we'll talk about Mars exploration, too, because it's awful exciting. There we go. It's been a fantastic evening. Uh, of course, I believe the stands will be up here very shortly. Um, but Doug will be signing many, many books there in the back. Many are pre-signed, of course. We'll personalize them as well. I have to tell you from a history research writer point of view that uh, although the odds they thought were less than 50-50 perhaps for getting to the moon itself, uh, pulling out this book is even worse, the odds. <laughs> uh, it takes a strong man to take this on and an even better writer, of course, and researcher to pull it off. So it's a fabulous book. Please go ahead and help yourself to Horizon Books out there in the... Uh... And, and what a great moderator I've had. It's amazing. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you.